unfortunately. You would, uh, that's some, that's some, uh, send off, my brother. So, thank you. So, firstly, I want to welcome all of you, and I thank our Lutheran, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins for coming to honour and celebrate Shane's life with our family, friends and people who loved Shane's songs and music. It's lovely and very fitting to see you gathered in this church as this is where our mother attended Mass every Sunday and where Shane would accompany her when he was home. I want to thank Father Pat Gilbert and Father Lorcan Kelly and the other priests that officiated actually because there was more than I was aware of uh, but also to fra thank Father Brendan Maloney, who came especially to officiate at this Mass today, just as he officiated with such grace at our mother's funeral in the Civil Lines Parish. I also want to thank everyone who played their part in this ceremony, and Glenn Hansard for organising the artists and musicians who sang and played so beautifully. <laughs> Padero Rieda and the stunning Kule Choir. And uh, Sean O'Shea, who Shane was a huge fan of. And I see that Finbar Fury snuck in, and Shane adored and idolised Finbar Fury. to Olin Clark, who took on the mammoth task of arranging this farewell for Shane, along with his team. There were some wonderful professionals amongst them, but many were Shane's good and loyal friends who worked as tirelessly for him in his passing as they had for him in life. Shane spent the last six months of his life in hospital. But even during that time, unsurprisingly, there was hardly a dull moment. In fact, the many friends who visited him and joined Victoria and myself and the wider family meant he rarely spent a moment alone. We must give special mention to Tom Cray. <laughs> and Brian Corgadden. who stayed steadfastly by his side, Tom sleeping in a chair by his bed at night, watching him while he slept. Special thanks also to his home carers and friends, Liz Flood and Zakiti Dlamini. <laughs> who continue to provide him with such loving care in the hospital for which we are so thankful. Shane held court there as usual, issuing orders from his hospital bed, which included the fetching of copious amounts of tea with exact amounts of milk and exact stirring to be lined up before him. We wish to thank the doctors and nurses at St. Vincent's University Hospital for taking such good care of him and always ensuring his comfort, which allowed us to share laughter and loving moments with him to the end we will be eternally grateful to you. It was at... No, thank you. I'm just gonna take a sip because my mouth's gonna be dry. It was at another hospital that my brother took his first breaths on Christmas day, 1957, at Pembury Hospital near Tunbridge Wells in Kent, where my Tipperary-born mother Therese and Dubliner father Morris had emigrated to, choosing the town of Tunbridge Wells as my father's sister, Sybil Harriman, was already living there. The hospital is excellent today, but on that Christmas Eve my mother was less than impressed as the nurses were having a hoolie as she went into labour 
and ignored her shouts for attention. However, all ended and thus began well, and Shane being delivered safely, his photograph as Christmas baby was displayed on the host hospital wall, and so began his life as a pin-up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I came along five years later, and the family home remained in Kent until Shane was 13 years old. I have many happy memories of those days. It is well known that Dad and Shane constantly read Irish literature together and discussed it avidly, and that our mother, also a voracious reader, passed on to him her own volumes of Hardy and Dickens, which he also devoured. I had early warning that my brother was somewhat precocious. Both Shane and I wrote and drew constantly. I was six years old, squatted down before the television and feverishly colouring in a tree I had just drawn. I had made the bark blue and I was in the process of colouring the leaves pink when the 11-year-old Shane peered over my shoulder to see what I had drawn. No, he said kindly, the bark should be brown and the leaves green. Then suddenly, as if struck by a revelation, he said, oh no, it's okay, you're a surrealist. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and when I asked him what this meant, he looked at my six-year-old self with some disdain. It was in that house that after one of us had committed a crime, Mum in a fluster would shout, Shavon, Shivain, as we hid from her wrath upstairs, looking at each other in confusion, pointing accusingly at one another. It was here that we ate Rice Krispie cake and intently watched Doctor Who, each of us having a toy Dalek, which we would roll over the floor, crying, exterminate. <laughs> it was a word that seemed to roll quite naturally off Shane's tongue. Here we ran resplendent in Batman in Robin suits. No prizes for guessing who was Batman. Here too, both at our house and theirs, we enjoyed many sing-songs and parties with our cousins the Harrymans here today. And where we lived when Shane at 13 won the Daily Mirror Literary Prize. It was also here that when Jimi Hendrix died, Shane spent the entire, entire day lying on his bed in silence, face to the wall. The seeds were firmly planted, his love of literature and love of music. But Shane's veins ran with Irish blood, and it was in Tipperary, our mother's childhood home, that Shane reunited with the land he loved, found his spiritual home. Here in a small cottage, heaving with 12 or more great aunts and uncles, but somehow never feeling cramped, he listened to their stories, sang with them songs, sat by the fire as Auntie Ellen swang the concertina. It was a holy place that threw unholy hoolies, and a neighbour often said of it, there'd be sparks flying from the floor. It was here that our mother honed her beautiful singing voice, and Shane's adored Uncle Sean had hailed from, as well as his cattle cousins. Shane absorbed the magical mayhem of this place, and along with the musical talents of his mother, the literary leanings of his father, and their enduring love for their son, it would be the greatest influence on his life. Here in Tipperary, he did not ignore his brotherly duties. Out in the fields, he would look for freshly laid cow pats and force my face into them, picking up the harder ones to hurl at me. While gathering the hay with the men at our auntie Monica's nearby farm, he took umbrage at his annoying little sister coming with a caddy of tea and pancakes and lifted me to toss me into the hole in the cone-shaped hay where I shouted for help until one of my uncles came to rescue me. But he did also try to protect me. When I was tiny, to my shame, I was tossing small stones at a poor cock turkey in the yard, and unsurprisingly the turkey retaliated. It started to chase me, spreading its wings, and I being tiny, it seemed like a creature from Jurassic Park. Shane raced to alert Uncle John, 
who came and aimed fire with his gun, felling the turkey. So my br brother rescued me from certain death. Or perhaps he hoped Uncle John's aim might be poor. It was here too that when we were called for the rosary each evening, we would hide behind a nearby field stone wall. It was this stone wall with the gap in it that became immortalized in the song Broad Majestic Shannon. I sat for a while by the gap in the wall, found a rusty tin can and an old hurley ball, heard the cards being dealt and the rosary called. When Shane was 13, we moved to London and lived in the still under construction Barbican. Here, Shane's love and obsession with music came to the fore. In his room, replete with psychedelic green light and Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix and Rolling Stones posters, he would sit at his table and earnestly study his music magazines, Sounds, Melody Maker and Enemy. They became his Bible. A napalm bomb of music would blast from his room and when he went out I would sneak into that mysterious and hallowed den and spin a record from his now huge collection of vinyl and dance under the green light. We had moved to Well Street just off Oxford Street when punk broke. This was to be a transformative time and milestone in his life. The energy of anarchy spoke to Shane and in a flash his hippie sensibility was gone. In fact, I remember taking a photograph of Shane in 1976 with his long hair out on the summer street holding an Iggy Pop record. When I look, next looked around, his hair was hacked off and bleached a shocking white. And Shane O'Hooligan, who would pen the fancy bondage, give the jam their first review and form the nips for Chan Bradley was born. The Nips attracted attention and released records produced by fan Paul Weller. But it was to be when Shane fused his punk energy with his love of Irish music that the road became clear before him. In 1982, Pope Mahone, consisting of Shane, Spider Stacy, Jem Finer and James Fernley was born. I witnessed their early ramshackle gigs and drew their just look them straight in the eye and say Pope Mahone posters. They played now iconic London venues like the Hope and Anchor and Bull and Gate and underground clubs with their friends, the Shillelagh Sisters, Bootle Foot Tappers and the men they couldn't hang. As the ben band started to grow in number, they rehearsed at their friend Rick Traverne's King Cross flat while I ate bread and marmite in the small kitchen, listening to the crashing and banging coming from the back room. From heaving sweaty gigs, the stomping, ever-growing crowds hoisted them from obscurity and sent them hurtling onto hallowed stages like the Dominion in Tottenham Court Road, where an ecstatic audience invaded the stage. This manic live following brought the band to the attention of Stiff Records and they released their first album, Red Roses for Me, as the Pogues in October 1984. After the Dominion, the second sign that my brother was onto something was when the band supported Elvis Costello at the Brixton Academy and I heard the crowd calling out Shane's name. And so the journey began. I'm not going to list the body of work that is so well known and respected or the many achievements and accolades bestowed on both Shane and January 2018, at his 60th birthday celebration in the National Concert Hall in Dublin, Shane received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his outstanding contribution to Irish life, music and culture from Anouk Turon, the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. And... <laughs> cried. He probably cried because our beloved mother, who had died just one year before, was not there to see this moment, although somehow we both knew she was. But he probably also cried because
because to receive that award from the President of Ireland meant more than any other. I remember him as a little boy, a bit gangly, in a blue anorak, who whenever we came home to tip would rush to retrieve a cap from one of our uncles. Proudly he would twist it onto his head and run out into the fields. At sunset he'd sit down by the fire and listen to the songs and old stories. And those long summer days and nights, that love and devotion to Tipperary and Ireland gave birth to a dream. He dreamed of one day being the teller of stories, the singer of the songs. He dreamed of following in the footsteps of those great Irish lyricists and musicians he so admired. He dreamed of continuing this proud tradition. He dreamed that one day he might add his name to those he had gone before him. And so when the president put that award in his hands, he knew he had achieved that dream. So Shane, you did what you dreamed. You did what you said you were gonna do in those long ago days in Tipperary. And you did it with such heart and fire fire that is not dimmed by death, for you have lit that fire and it burns now in Ireland and all over the world. And so Shane, with words from Dad and I, your little sister and your father, we are so proud of you, so very proud of you, our darling. And I whisper farewell to you, but only for now, in your own words. And as the sunset came to meet the evening on the hill, I told you I'd always love you. I always did, and I always will.